All right. Welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to keep talking about objects, which we introduced on Monday. Uh, we'll review a little bit about how to design new types in Java using uh, Java's class mechanism. Uh, and we'll look at some of the features that objects have, some sort of standard ways of creating them, uh, options that you have when you create an object for how to construct it, and then how we provide access to the object's methods and its fields uh, to other parts of your code that might be using an instance of that particular class. All right, so first thing I want to do is, you know, just from last time, look again at a class, example class declaration. So this is how you tell Java that you're creating a new type. You are creating an, whoop, that's not how you do it. Um, you're creating a new type in the language, right? Now, in addition to ints and doubles and longs and strings and other things that Java comes with built in, I can also create person objects. I can create instances of this class, this category. Remember, this is a general category that you know, can, allows us to describe many different people. This is not a specific person. Rather, it's a class of data, of object in your program, right? Each person has some pieces of data. So every person object that I work with in my program has a couple of uh, instance variables. These are different pieces of data that we're collecting together to try and describe an instance of a person. Here, I've declared two of them. You can add more. This is up to you. You're the designer now, right? This is opening up Java's toolbox and allowing you to design your own types. For our particular application, we've decided that a person has a name, uh, which is a string, and then an age, which is an integer. I'm initializing that age explicitly here to zero. And your, um, your instance variable um, declarations can include an initialization, just the way you would do with the local variable in your program. Okay. Now, again, you know, how we design our classes uh, depends a lot on what we're doing with them. So, in, so, for example, when we track data about this class, we have a, I essentially have the equivalent of this. It doesn't look exactly like this, but we have the idea of information about every student or every staff member that is part of the class. And we store a name, right? I mean, that's a pretty important piece of information. We actually break it into first and last, um, but we store all sorts of different pieces of information. We store information like your university ID number. We store information like what lab section you're assigned to, right? Um, so again, you know, the specific pieces of information that we include inside this class definition is directly tied to what we're trying to do in our program. A program that has a notion of a person from the perspective of maintaining bank records is going to have a very different, uh, but probably slightly overlapping version of the same person that I'm using to track student records, right? So this really depends on what you're doing, okay? So I decide what pieces of data I'm going to need to describe each instance of a person. And again, these can all be different, right? But what, what creates a class is that every person that I create in my system now needs to, in my program, now needs to have these two fields, now has these two fields. Right? So we need to think about things that every person that we're going to be working with has. So again, going back to my example, every student at this university has a university ID number, and they're all unique. Every one of you has a net ID. That's the part before the at sign in your email address. Those are also all unique. And so you know, these are different pieces of information that we can use uh, to you know, record more information about you. I can also, remember, objects combine state and behavior. So data and methods, right? Data and algorithms. So here my class stores two pieces of data so far. Again, I could add more. A string that's a name and an age that's an integer. And then inside my class declaration, I also get to describe behavior or methods associated with every instance of that class. These are called instance methods. If I give you a variable that is an instance of a person, 
you now, using dot notation, have two functions that I've defined that you can call. The first one is called print name. These look exactly like the method declarations you've already been writing. They start with a type, I have a name, a list of arguments. There is a difference here, though, right? And we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, which is that these instance methods can use the variables that are defined as part of the class. So print name always has access to both a variable called name that's a string and a variable called age that's an int. Every instance method that I define always has access to the current values of name and age for that instance of the object. So here I've got a print name method and it's gonna print off the name. You notice that this name variable is not defined inside the function. It's not passed to the function, right? So the question is where does it come from? It's defined on the class. And so class instance methods have access to this information. Birthday's similar, right? I can also modify that, right? So here's a function that I call on your birthday. What does it do? It increments your age. That age is the age that's defined on the class. And the value of that age is whatever the value is for the instance of the class that you called birthday on. Okay, we'll play with this in the playground in a minute, get a little bit, get a little more of a sense. So last time we introduced this notion of this, this uh, special variable that refers to the instance of the class or the object that's currently executing a method. So you can use this inside instance methods. So I can say this dot width, that's my width, the width of the instance of the object that's currently executing the method. All right, same thing with this dot height. However, most of the time, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're just gonna use width and height. You can, and again, I would say use wh whichever is cleaner, but you don't see people using a lot of explicit this in Java programs. Instead, what we do is we say width and height, and what happens is when Java looks for what variable you're talking about, so when Java compiles this program, it gets to the definition of area, and it says, okay, this is, this code is referring to a variable called width and a variable called height. The first place it looks is inside the function. It says, is there a local variable called width? And the answer is no, there's no local variables in this function. Is there a parameter to the method called width? No, there's no parameters to the method called width. The next place it looks is inside the class definition. So it says, does the class have an instance variable called width? The answer is yes, okay? So, for clarity, we're usually not going to use this. I actually went through in the past, I've used it on these slides, and I, I sort of rethought it today. I said, this is not a good idea, right? Because you don't see it very often, right? So instead, and this also helps you get used to the fact that these instance methods have access to this information. That's one of the reasons you write them. Okay, so, oh, one other important note. So it turns out that in Java, everything you write has to be included in a class. So those little snippets we've been writing on the playground before where we just wrote a method, on the homework problems where you just wrote a method, we've just said wrote, write a method. Or even earlier in the class for the first week and a half, we had you write little snippets of code. Those are not valid Java code. You can't compile them. So how do we get them to work? We get them to work by essentially, behind your back, sneaking them into a class declaration so that Java will execute them correctly. From this point forward, in this class, the playground examples are not going to do that anymore. So we have been kind of tricking you for long enough in the aim of making things simpler for you to think about. Now, instead, when we work in the playground, most of the examples are actually going to define a class and they're gonna find a method called main, and that's where the example will begin to execute, okay? So if I run this code, it's going to print hello world. However, if I try to do something that we would have been able to do just the other day, and actually put a method in here, right, so this worked on Monday, and it worked last Friday, and it is not going to work anymore. So you can't do this in, in actual valid job. 
You may have noticed this in the MP as well, right? Java doesn't allow us to define a method at the top of one of our, uh, on one of our files. We have to put it inside a class, right? So just so you know, right, how this is going to look, and you guys will get used to this. This is how we're gonna be doing things for the remainder of this semester. Everything still works the way you would expect. It's a little bit more boilerplate. That's why we don't do it for the first month, but we're doing it now mainly because we're gonna start designing some classes together and we, this, this starts to make more sense. Okay, all right. So let's look at this guy and let's sort of go through what's happening here and talk about how this works. So I've got two classes now that I've defined. I'm putting the code that's actually gonna run in this example inside this class called example, right? So when you, when you use the playground from here on out, the place that your code will start executing is inside this main method, okay? So this is the code I'm actually going to run. I'm gonna create a new dimensions object. I'm gonna set its width and height, and then I'm gonna print the result of calling an instance method that I've defined. That class is defined above, okay? And we, we see some new keywords here that we're gonna talk about in a minute. But this is a dimensions class. This might be useful for storing information about anything that has dimensions, anything that takes a two-dimensional space. So it has a width and a height that are both integers. And now I have this instance method called area. When I call area, I get the result of multiplying together whatever value the instance variables width and height have when, the, when that method is called, okay? Let's run this and just make sure it does what we think it's going to do. You don't have to add these, the string unused to, you can just do this, also works. Oh, no you do, you do, sorry. You still need to fix that, okay. Um, but any questions about this? This looks similar to what we were doing on Monday. It's just wrapped inside a class now. This is all stuff too. Everything on this slide will make sense in about a week. I know there's some new things here. Some of them we'll talk about today. Some we'll talk about Friday. Some we'll talk about next week. Yeah, so the question is, why does main take this argument? I was actually going to talk about this last week when we looked at how to compile and run programs. Um, let me give the answer here. Some of you may be interested in this, others may not. When you run your program, um, you're allowed to pass it arguments. Those arguments end up inside this array. When you run the program inside our sandbox, you are never provided any arguments. That's why the array is sort of pointless, right? But you have to define the function using the signature Otherwise, the tool that we use to run your code can't find it. Again, if that didn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it, right? Just keep using the signature and the code inside that method will work. Okay. So now, again, I mean, the, 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 the thing that peop, trips, trips people up about objects is when we start working with multiple objects. Okay, so let's take a, a second object here initialize its width and height, and let's set them to be something that's different than the first one, about four and eight, okay? And then let's print, well, let's leave that one, and then we'll do a second call to print the dimensions of the second object. So, again, now here I have two, I have a single class, let me scroll up a little bit and pull this down so you guys can see the whole code snippet. I have a single class. The class is called dimensions. This defines what it means for an object to be a dimensions object. It has a height and a width. It also has a method called area that I can call. Down here in my example, I create two instances of the class dimensions. Sometimes we call them objects. I create two objects of type dimensions. I've defined a new type in Java. Down here, I've created two instances of that type and stored them in the variables example and second. I set their width and height using dot notation, and then I call this instance method, again, using dot notation. And this is, again, the thing that I think, you know, sometimes takes people a little bit of time and practice to kind of muddle through. The area method is the same for both of them. It's the same logic. It results in a different value because the two dimensions objects, despite the fact that they both have a width and height, have different values for that width and height. So when I call area on one, I get 200 because its width and 
is 10, its height is 20. If I call area on the second, I get 32. Right? If I change, let's see what happens here. So let's do, um, let's change the height of example to be 40. And then let's run example.area again. Okay, so now what you see is that the first time I call example.area, I get the result 200 because that's correct given the values of the instance variables width and height at that point. Later on line 19, I change the value of height. Now when I compute the area of example, I get a different result because width is 10 and height is 40. Right? So my area is 400. Any questions about this? Please ask now. Yeah. So those would also work if we didn't take examples and we set dimensions that area, right? Or, uh, nope. Uh, yeah. So okay. So the question is, what happens if I do is this this what you want to try? Yeah. 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 So this this won't work. We will talk about how to define a method like this next week. But in order and but this is a great great question, right? In order, the reason why this won't work is because I actually have two different instances of dimensions. Second an example. And in order to compute the area properly, the area function needs to know which one of them I want to compute the area of, right? So if I call dimension.area, I'm not passing, I'm not telling the area function which instance of this class do you actually want to compute the area for. Right? So, again, great question. Right? Um, I don't, don't know if there's a Python analog here, but this code is not going to compile. Right? Um, and again, we, we will see how to write a method that does compile like this later, but it still won't do what we want, right? What we want is we want for, but, but again, let's also step back and kind of admire how this works, right? Now, every single example, sorry, every single instance of dimensions comes with a built-in area function. Now again, you may think that this is kind of silly, right? I mean, this is easy to compute, right? But think about the string class you guys have been working with. That has like a hundred different methods. Some of those are actually not easy to, to program if you had to do it yourself. But they're built in. So you get a string and you can do all these things with it, right? Because it comes along, it carries along with it all of these useful methods that operate on its data. This is sort of the magic and the beauty of object-oriented programming. I have something that not only acts as a container for data, it stores the width and the height of whatever I want to store the dimensions for, but now I can do things like use it to do computations. And I only have to do that computation once inside the class, inside the method that I define, and then instances of that class come with that functionality, that algorithm built into them. Other questions about this? Again, if you're not fully 100% on this, let's stop and slow down and make sure that we get you there. Because this is, this is critical. Yeah. Okay, what are public and static for? We'll get there. All right? Public we will talk about today. Static we'll talk about next week. Yeah. Ah, okay, great question. So the question is what happens if I initialize the values inside the class? So let's say, let's say my default width is going to be 10 for some reason. This is not a good default width, right? So right now, nothing is going to change. Right? But now, let's say that I create, let's change it this way. So I create a second dimensions object on line 14. But I don't set its width. Okay? What do you think is going to print on line 18 when I print the area of second? Yeah. 40. Yeah, because now, when I created second, I gave it a default value for the width of 10, and I didn't change it. The reason why nothing changes if I remove this comment is because I'm, so what happens here is that when I get second back on line 14, it has a width of 10. In fact, let's print that just to convince ourselves. Another great question. So now you can see that when it comes back, it has a width of 10. But then I modify it. I overwrite it to eight before I call area. So if you want to set default values for some of the instance variables that you define as part of a class, you can do it using the syntax, right? And that's how it works. We're going to, in a minute, we're going to talk about a better way to provide initial value 
for the variables that make up a class. Other questions? Again, I'm happy to pause here for as long as you guys need. I know, you know, again, this is like the point in the class where like, some of you that have had some background, particularly if your background hasn't included work with objects or classes before, um, this is brain work, right? It's not just, you know, hacking together some code. This is a new conceptual framework for thinking about how your program's working. And that can take some getting used to, right? So again, you may feel confused even though you look at the code and you're like, this is really simple. I mean, there's not even a loop, right? I'm just like assigning variables values, like why is this complicated? But it does take some, there's some conceptual material here that takes some time to internal. Right? So, so make sure you give yourself that time. Don't get frustrated if it doesn't make sense right away. All right. So now let's talk about what happens when an object is created. So if I look back over here, um, we've been using this keyword called new. So what I've showed you so far, I've showed you how to create an object in the following way. I call new, sorry, I use the new keyword, and then I have the name of the class, and then I have something that looks like a method call. It's a pair of parentheses. There's nothing inside them. But, so you might have been wondering, what is this doing over here? It's kind of hanging out, right? Uh, does it work if I get rid of that? No. So I can't just do this. This is going to be a, a compiler error. So I have to put in these, these, uh, these parentheses, and again, this looks a lot like how I call a method when I call one of the methods, right? And it turns out that's exactly what's happening. That's why it looks that way. There's a special method that's called when, um, when an object is created. When a new instance of a class is created, there is a method called a constructor that is run. And that constructor, as its name implies, has the opportunity to construct a new instance of the object and to modify some of the fields that the object has before it's first used. Okay, so if I go back here, when I call new, there's a constructor that runs before the result is saved into my variable second. Okay, so before the object is actually returned and saved into the variable and I start using it, this special function called a constructor runs. Constructors are just code. They can do whatever they want. There's a they have a couple of limitations in Java, but in general, you can do whatever you want inside your constructor. You have access to the same instance variables that the instance methods do. It's just, this is a function that's called at a special time. It also can't be called again. This is only called when the function is created. There's no way to call it again later. Constructors have a special syntax, right? Um, so if you look up here, this is a constructor. Now it looks a little different than the method definitions. It looks sort of similar to some of the method definitions we've seen, right? Like there's a list of something that looks like a list of arguments here, and those are in fact arguments. I can pass arguments to a constructor. We're gonna do that in a minute. What's missing here though? This looks a little weird, right? If I compare this with the method or function declarations you guys have been writing up until this point, if I, if, up until this point, if I gave you this on a quiz or something and I said, what's wrong with this, what would you say? What's missing? Yeah, somebody over here. Yeah, there's no return type, right? There's like the name of the method, arguments, but there's nothing to the left of that name, right? There's no return type there. Okay, so that's one interesting thing. There's something else that's a little weird about this. Someone, someone tell me, something about the name of the function is a little unusual, at least compared with, yeah. It's the same name as the class, which means that it is, it's capitalized. Normally the methods we've been having you write, check style will force you to start them with a the lowercase letter, and then use camel case if you want to join multiple words together. Here, the method is called course. It's capitalized, and as the respondent pointed out, it shares the same name as the class, and it has to. That's a, that's a requirement for a constructor. So a constructor has to have the same name as the class that it is constructing. It also cannot define a return type, and it also can't return. The reason for this is that constructors always return a new instance of the object, so there's no need to return anything uh, or to define what the return value is. 
The reason that we create constructors is so that we can initialize our class properly. It provides a way of setting up the class initially that's both more convenient than what we've been doing so far, and also allows us to enforce certain things about the class when it's created, right? Constructors always have the same name as the class that they're constructing, um, and they never uh, define a return type and cannot explicitly return. You can't use a return statement inside a constructor. One thing that's important to point out about constructors is that like other functions, you can overload a constructor. So I can have multiple definitions of a constructor with different arguments. And Java picks the one to run the way that it normally does when I have overloaded methods. So here, I have a class called course. Imagine this is storing information about a class that is taught here at the University of Illinois. Um, one of the things that that class has is a name. And here I have two constructors that I've defined. I have one that sets the name based on an argument that I pass. And I have another one that if you don't pass me an argument, it sets the name to an empty string, okay? Um, so here's an example of two different ways of creating a new instance of this class. In one way, I pass a string that gets set to be the name. In the other way, I don't pass anything, and the name ends up being blank. All right, last little bit before we play around with this a little bit. So constructors can also, dele what, what we call this is delegation. Constructors can delegate to other constructors. So a constructor can call another constructor. The way you do that is a return of our friend this. So this can also be used as a method. So let's look at this. This is actually, oh, sorry, wrong way. This is the same as this. These two are accomplishing the same thing. They're doing it in a different way. So what's happening here, if I call the constructor and I pass a string, that string gets set as the name of the new course that I'm creating that's being constructed. If I call the empty constructor that takes no arguments, all it does is call this constructor and pass a string argument, which in this case is the empty string. Here, there's not much advantage to doing this because both these constructors are very similar. But when your constructors get more comp complicated, sometimes you want the constructors that don't take as many arguments to call the constructors that take more arguments because then you don't, can avoid duplicating some of the same logic. In Python, you typically do this using default arguments. Java doesn't have a notion of default arguments, and so this is the best that we can do. Is it worse? It is worse, right? This is one place where Python has improved on Java. Um, but this is how we can accomplish something similar in Java. All right. So you may have wondered, you know, we haven't written a constructor before, so how have we been allowed to create a class? And the reason is that if you don't provide a constructor, you get a default constructor that takes no arguments and does nothing, right? So uh, this, which is kind of what we've been doing so far, is the same as this. So here, I've defined a constructor that takes no arguments and it does nothing. This is an empty block. So it doesn't initialize name, it doesn't do anything, other, any other sort of setup, right? Um, so constructors have to return an instance of the new class. This turns out to be kind of irritating in certain cases. Um, we'll come back and talk about this later in the course when we talk about uh, exceptions and errors in Java and how to both generate them and handle them. But for now, one of the things that constructors can't really do is they can't validate their arguments, right? So what if, for example, I wanted to check something about the name and not create the class if the name's invalid. So if you look at course names, for example, here at the University of Illinois, they all have a format, right? There's like a code, a number, a colon, and a title. And so I could, in, if you pass me a name, I could check the name to make sure that it falls into that format. I could check the, the two letters at the front, or three letters, or four letters, uh, to make sure that that's one of the, co the course codes here, right? like CS or ECE or, so this came up on Reddit recently. Apparently, BADM, I guess that stands for Business Administration. Is that correct? So every time I see that, I think of badminton, right? So people are like, badminton 101 is so hard, and I'm like, why, right? It's like an easy game, you just, anyway. 
I, I don't know why. I just feel like it's cool that we have a whole department devoted to Batman. Um, all right, so, so I, could, I could do this inside the constructor, but there's no way to fail, right? Even if the name turns out to be invalid, I can't not return an instance of the class. I can't return null. Um, and so I still have to create the class, right? inside my constructor. So there's essentially really no way to do argument validation in a constructor effectively until we talk about errors and exceptions later in the class, right? We'll get there. And there's another uh, pattern for doing this using static methods, which we'll talk about next week. All right, so now let's mess around a little bit with our, with our person class, all right? So let's give this person a name and let's use a double for the age, you know, just try to be a little bit more accurate. Okay, so this is already going to work. And what you'll see is that, um, what's the value of name going to be in this case? It's gonna be null, right? So imagine I don't like this. Imagine I wanna make sure that you always have a name, even if it's the empty string, right? So I could do that like this. I could say, I could define a constructor. This is the empty constructor. This is the default constructor. So what I've been getting so far is just this. It takes no arguments and it does nothing. So if I run this code again, I'm gonna get the same result. But let's say that I wanna make sure that the name is always a valid string. So now I can set the name to be the empty string and now you'll see that I can make sure that there's always a valid name there to access, right? So difference between this and the code that we just ran is that this will crash. So if I don't initialize the name, I get null. I get no name, there's no name there. And so if I try to do something like figure out how long your name is, it crashes. I might not want that. Instead, I'm gonna make sure that even if you create a person without a name, it always has a valid string even if the string has no data. Now, however, what I would really like to do is I'd really like to make you provide a name. Like, that's something that I think every person should have, right? So what I really want to do is something that looks like, you know, this. I want to, so currently I can do this as follows. If I want to set the name of the person that I created, I can set it here. Let's just print the name rather than name.length. So we know it's valid. Good. But this, this uh, pattern of creating an empty object and then initializing all of its fields is really sort of, uh, it's awkward, right? What I would really like is to do something like this. So I'd like to force every person to have a name, and you have to provide that name to me when you create the new person object. So how do I accomplish that? I need a constructor that takes a name as an argument. Okay, so now I've, I've changed my constructor. It used to take no arguments. Now it takes a single argument, which is a string. I'm gonna call that string set name. And all I do inside my constructor is set the name of this new person object that I'm in the process of constructing to be whatever you pass. And so now you can see this works. And so this is kind of nice. This is what I wanted. I want to make sure that you provide me with the name. One question you might have is, can I still call the empty constructor? Maybe I don't want to provide a name. So can I still do this? Anybody want to take a guess? You can just try it, right? Uh, okay, so one hypothesis is that if I do this, it'll call the default constructor and I'll end up with a null name, okay? Let's try it. Nope. So it's actually nice. As soon as I define a constructor, I lose the default constructor, right? So as soon as I define a constructor on line four, that default constructor is gone. And this is actually really good because I don't want that default constructor anymore. Right? I don't want you to be able to call a person without a name. You know, I've set up my constructor on my class because I want you to force you to provide me with a name. Right? And so now you can't do this anymore. And this doesn't compile, which is exactly what we want. Java knows that this class has a constructor. 
as soon as the class has a constructor, I can't use the default constructor anymore. And so now if I want to create a person, I have to pass a string. Now again, I, you know, you can pass an empty string, right? You can pass, you know, this is not a person. Um, you know, you can, I, like, I don't know if this is a name or not, right? But at least I can force you to pass me a string. You can also, if you are really feeling vicious, do this. And that will also work. And it will cause bad things to happen, right? But hopefully you want your code to not crash and you're actually going to, uh, oh, I was upset about something else. Oh, this is a different problem. See, even I forgot. Okay, questions about this? All right, one other, in so, so what other information should our constructor probably require that you provide? So now I'm requiring you to provide a name. Yeah, yeah, like people have an age, you know. Um, here, it's not quite as bad because this is a primitive type, so it can't be null, so I'm just gonna get zero. But to be honest, I think that people should probably have an age. So now I'm gonna change my constructor again. And I'm gonna also initialize the age. And so now again, this code won't compile at first because my call to on 11, to try to, when I'm trying to create this new person, I'm not providing enough information. You said you have to, now I say you have to provide both a name and an age. And so now I'm gonna be forced to do this, right, which is nice. Okay, so let's do one other thing. Let's imagine that, you know, this is being used by some sort of hospital record system, and maybe there's a, maybe there's a case where when a new person is born, I actually want to create a person with the age of zero. So I want to have a way to create a person with just a name in the case that that person was just born, and so I want to initialize their, their age to zero. How would I do that? I mean, I can call this constructor and just pass zero. That will work. But let's say I want to make this a little bit more convenient, right? I want zero to be the default value. How do I do that? Yeah. Okay, so I could do it that way, right? So that's kind of already what's happening, but I'm still forcing, well, so age is already actually being initialized to zero. I could put this here to be more explicit, but when I have an uninitialized double as part of a class, it ends up with zero as a default value. What I want is I want something, I want to be able to do something like this and get a default value of age as zero. Right, so right now, if I try to run this, it's not going to compile. Yeah. Yeah, so let's just write a new constructor. Remember, I can have as many of these as I want as long as their signatures are different. So now all I'm going to do is not set the age, right? Because I know my default age is zero. So now I have a way of, of creating a person either by passing a name and an age, or by passing an age. Last thing I could do, so right now I've got two constructors, but I see that they're sharing some code already, right? They both set the name. If I want to avoid that, I can use this to call the other constructor. Now I'm just calling the method. So I use the name that you provided, and I use my default age as zero, right? And you know, maybe, for example, um, you know, Typically when, um, you know, like, it's not like this gets entered into the system immediately when somebody is born, right? Because, like, the nurse is going to stand there and look at the baby for a few minutes because it's cool and whatever, and then they get around to doing the paperwork. So I'll, I'll set a default age of 0 0.01, right? It's like, it's a little unrealistic to imagine that immediately after this baby pops out, we're, like, fiddling with the computer. All right. Questions about this before... Before we go on. All right, so now, so essentially kind of what we're doing over the next couple of days is we're, we're gaining more control over our classes, right? We started off with just these basic ways to hold data, to provide some functionality, and now we're gonna be gaining more control over how they're created, how the data inside of them is accessed, things like this, right? So the next step in this and, uh, is to, well actually any questions about constructors? I should stop here and pause. I don't really care if I get onto access modifiers yet today or not. 
Now we'll get there next time. Any questions about this process? So again, it's kind of, you know, we started off with objects as just a way of joining together some state and some functionality, and now I'm gaining control over the process of creating. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, so let's go back and look at this. So what's happening here? What is this doing? So this is calling another constructor. If I use this as a method and I pass it arguments, what's going to happen? In fact, we can do this. Let's put some, let's put some statements in here. We'll say um, first constructor and then So let's put some tracing statements in so we can watch what's happening. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this gets angry, angry with me. Yeah. So now let's think about, and, and I'll just put it down here. Well, that's good. They're going to be backwards. So, so when you, if you're going to call another constructor, it has to be the first thing you do inside that method. So I can't put a print statement above it. What's happening here is, let's think about exactly what happens on line 15. So I start on the right side, I see this new keyword, that means I'm creating a new object. I look at the type, this is person. This is a, this is not string, it's not something that's built in, this is a class that I've defined right above. So I'm creating a new instance of this person class. And then what Java's gonna do is it's gonna look for a constructor that matches the arguments that I've provided. I provided one string argument. I have two constructors. One of them takes a string and a double in that order. The second one takes only a string. So Java says, okay, well, I'm gonna run the second constructor. So it starts executing, it gets to line 10. Now it sees this. This is a call to another constructor, and you'll see that it's being passed a string and a double. So now it says, okay, now I should jump to the other constructor that takes a string and a double that's right here. So that's why when I call this, even though I'm only passing the string, you see first constructor is printed. Because I started on line 15, I jumped here into this constructor, when I executed line 10, I ended up on line five. And then what I did is I initialized the name and age to the arguments that were provided, which are the name that I passed to my one argument constructor, and this special default value for age, which is designed to indicate that the person is new, but not of age zero. Make sense, questions about this? It's a good, again, a good place to pause and think about what's happening. Oh, and then, just to finish line 15, now I've got this new object, and now I save it into this variable u that allows me to access. Yeah, that's not gonna, yeah, let's try it. So the question is, what happens if I try to call myself inside a constructor? Um, Java knows that this is bad, yeah. So basically you'll get a compiler error here. We'll talk about recursion later in the semester, but recursion inside your constructors is typically not a good thing, right? So now you're being like, oh, how do I set the name? Well, I call myself, right? And the Java compiler is smart enough to figure out, no, 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 it's not gonna end well, right? Um, so yeah. If I try to call another constructor that doesn't exist, again, I get some sort of compiler error. So imagine I have a, you know, Java knows that there's no, there's no uh, method, there's no constructor that takes three arguments here, where the first one is a string, the second one is a double, and the third one is a double. Um, so yeah, great questions. Other questions? I think given the time, we may just, let's see what else have on tap for today. Uh, let's see. I think this is okay. I think this is a good place to, to stop and just look at this for a few more minutes. Again, any, any other questions? I'm just gonna, if you guys want to start packing up, that's fine. Uh, but I think it's better to just hang out here for a few minutes and kind of keep puzzling through this. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, okay, great question. So let's try that again. So the question is, why can't I put this statement here, which I tried to do and then forgot that Java doesn't like this. So the error message here kind of uh, 
kind of says it all. So essentially, but this is a great question. If I'm gonna call another constructor inside my constructor using this, it has to be the first thing I do inside that method. I can do other stuff afterwards, but I just have to call this first. So here I'm trying to print first, so actually let's, uh, let's put this afterwards. So I can put it afterwards, that's not gonna be a problem. So now what happened? So now this is a little bit confusing because the call is after the call to the first constructor. So now when I started creating a new person on line 16, I called this constructor, correct? I used this to get into my two argument constructor. I printed first constructor, I set the name and age. Then before this constructor completed, it printed again, right? So I can do other things in there. I just can't, if, if I'm gonna call this and use another constructor, it has to be the first thing that happens, right? Java enforces that rule. There are, there are reasons for this that I'd be, be happy to discuss on the floor. Uh, but for now, if you, if you forget this, Java will remind you the way it reminded me. Yeah, great question. Other questions? For, yeah. Uh, so on the MP, it's like one, one like you do, uh, declare the variables that are added. How come here we're like just able to like declare the variables? Yeah, so the, the, so the question is there are, um, oh, we'll talk about this. So the question is, why am I allowed to declare these uh, public variables as part of my class? We'll talk about this next time, right? Uh, so typically in Java, you do not allow other classes to directly modify the instance variables of your class. Instead, there's a pattern for achieving this that gives you more control over what's happening. We'll talk about that on Friday. All right, so many of you have yet to take the midterm. Those that are still up for it today, good luck. I uh, wish you the best of luck. Um, I will see you guys on Friday.